Welcome to a new series of videos from chapter 6 on the subject of beams. We're starting off in section 1, subsection 1, and it's our first video which we're labeling A, and the focus is on shear and moment diagrams, and shear stress, and moment stress. If we draw a beam, um, you'll notice here that we have a simple horizontal beam with a uniform load W that would be in pounds per foot or kips per foot in the English system of units. Um, the total load on this beam would be W times L. So if this is in kips per feet and L is in feet, then we would end up with a total load that is W times L in kips. We have a support shown at each end. By the symmetry of the problem we know that um, each of the support points or each of these supports has to be providing a force which is equal to half of the total downward load. So if the total downward load is W times L then this upward reaction which we call V is equal to WL over 2. And on this end we have another WL over 2. Now we can imagine conceptually uh, performing a mental exercise or experiment where we say we'd like to know what's going on internal to this beam but we don't know anything about internal forces. We only have expressions that allow us to relate to external forces. For example uh, F equals MA, we sometimes say, uh, is interpreted as the sum of all the external forces is equal to the mass of the object times the acceleration of the object. If the object is in equilibrium, it doesn't accelerate, it uh, maintains zero velocity, in which case we would say the sum of all the external forces has to be zero. That doesn't tell us anything about internal forces, but we can do the following kind of things. We can create something called a free body. So in this case, I've taken half of this beam and drawn a picture of it and drawn all the forces on it. So there's distributed load over this length, which is L over 2, since the overall length is L. Uh, this dimension is L over 2. We have that load. We continue to have this reaction at the left end. And then we have something going on at the center here. Now, I, I deliberately went to the center of, excuse me, on the, the end of the beam that was exposed when we threw part of the beam away. We don't know exactly what's going on there, but if we look at this uh, free body, we see that this load W over this length L over 2 produces an overall force or an equivalent force which is W times L over 2 um, and that force is centered at this distribution. So if I put a point force there I see that I have a downward force of WL over 2 I have an upward force of WL over 2 and therefore, in terms of the total forces, this object is in equilibrium. In other words, there are no horizontal forces, and the two vertical forces are equilibrating each other, at least in terms of a net tendency of this beam to accelerate in any particular direction. The beam, or this half of the beam, is clearly not in equilibrium, though, under these two forces, because they are not collinear with each other, we have a downward force on this side, an upward force here. Those forces are tending to create clockwise movement. We therefore know there has to be something happening on this cut face, which is equilibrating that. And I'm going to represent this by this curly arrow, and I'm going to attach the symbol M to it. And this is the first step, by the way, in any kind of word problem is you draw whatever picture you can draw, you figure out what has to be there, and you represent it both graphically and in terms of a symbol. Because once you have this symbol, you can then write equations and figure out what this strange thing is that's happening on this cut face.
for the moment I've drawn a little circle around it and I've blown it up and I've shown the cut face and there should be a big question mark here that says what's going on on that face because this curly arrow that I drew here there are no curly arrows the curly arrow is an abstraction that says we know something is happening on that face and, and that it's tending to produce a counterclockwise rotation because that's what's necessary to equilibrate the clockwise rotation that's tending to take place because of these two vertical forces. So we'd like to try to understand what might be happening on that cut face and to do that we have this foam rubber beam. Here the beam is in its normal straight condition resting on the tabletop. Um, I've used a triangle here to draw a, two vertical lines uh, near the center lengthwise along the beam and I've also drawn a line down the center of the beam for reference purposes. Now if I pick this beam up and support it at each end uh, it turns out that this particular piece of foam rubber is heavy enough that it would bend under its own self weight not very serviceable as a building structure but really excellent for illustrating the kinds of deformations that occur in beams. Now it turns out that that straight line right there is still a straight line and this straight line right here is still a straight line. What has changed is that these two lines that were original parallel, originally parallel to each other and vertical are now canted so they're no longer parallel and they are no longer vertical but they are straight lines. Now what has to be happening here is some portion of this is shortening and other portions are elongating and it turns out if we put a curved tape along that line right there and we measured that distance and then we measured it along this curve here the two measurements would give the same number. In other words the length of this curved line along its length is equal to the length of that straight line. So we sometimes call this the neutral axis because there is no shortening or elongation occurring there. The further away we move from that neutral axis in the upward direction the shorter these little segments of material become and the greatest shortening occurs up at the top here which we sometimes refer to as the extreme fiber in bending. Uh, the key thing is to note that geometrically it's obvious that if that's a straight line and that's a straight line the amount of shortening that's occurring here is in direct proportion to how far away from the neutral axis we've moved. So here we have no shortening, here we have the maximum shortening, halfway in between we have half as much shortening. Likewise, as we move away from the neutral axis in the downward direction, um, we go from zero elongation here to maximum elongation down there. So and, and these two lines are straight lines. So the amount of elongation that's occurring in this zone is in direct proportion to how far away the material is from the neutral axis. Now we also know that for most structural materials that over the working range of stress in those materials the stress is in direct proportion to the deformation. So on the top here we have shortening, on the bottom we have elongation, and we can write those in terms of fractional deformation. In other words, we can talk about how much this segment of material along here shortened and divide the amount of shortening by the length of that material in its original state up here and that we call the fractional deformation or the fractional shortening. On the bottom we have a similar number where we measure how much this material elongates in going from this state to that state. We sometimes call that delta L and then the original length is L. Uh, 
So the ratio of delta L over L, or the elongation over the original length, gives us the fractional elongation or the fractional deformation on the bottom of this beam. Since we know the fractional deformation is in linear proportion to the distance away from the neutral axis, and since we know that the stress in the material is in proportion to the fractional deformation, we now know that the stress is in proportion to the distance from the neutral axis. In other words, the further I go upward from this neutral axis, the higher the compressive stress that's producing the shortening. And the further I go down in a linear manner, the tensile stress is increasing to a maximum down at the bottom. So we have a linear increase in compression stress on the top, a linear increase in tensile stress on the bottom. Um, we can also talk about objects that are curved this way, which we call a positive curvature, and we call the moment that produces this a positive moment. We can cantilever in this manner, where we have tension on the top and compression on the bottom. We sometimes refer to this as a negative moment. That's a kind of mathematical concept. Uh, more than a reality if the beam is symmetric, but we will talk about what the meaning of that might be in various circumstances. But you should understand that the amount of curvature is in direct proportion to the amount of moment that exists anywhere in this beam, and the moment is directly represented by that triangular uh, stress distribution that I just described. So if I come back to my drawing and I was asking the question, what's going on on this face? What we said was we've deduced that at the neutral axis, there's no compression or tension occurring on the cross section. That as we move upward, away from the neutral axis, the amount of, of uh, compressive stress increases. As we move downward from the neutral axis, the amount of tensile stress or bending stress uh, increases linearly as we go down. Um, these really should be called moment stresses because there are a lot of other stresses that are associated with bending, um, but for historical reasons these became known as bending stresses, so we designate that with little f for stress and B for bending, and then we put um, in parentheses top or bottom, depending on what we're talking about. So that triangular stress distribution is what is inducing this moment tendency, and it would be really good to get this diagram in your head uh, so that you can visualize it and understand it. Now there's a net force associated with this triangular stress distribution, which turns out to be two-thirds of the way up. It's centered two-thirds of the way up from the neutral axis towards the top. So we could treat this stress distribution as an equivalent point force uh, from an equilibrium point of view, and we'd locate it right there. And likewise, there would be an equivalent tension force down here that would represent the equilibrium equivalent of this distributed stress. Point forces, of course, are not reality. You cannot have a point force uh, because it would produce a finite force on zero surface, which would be infinite stress, and we don't tolerate that. But for equilibrium analysis, we can replace a distributed stress like this with a point force. This is a three-dimensional view of that stress distribution showing the compressive stress block on the upper half and the tensile stress block on the lower half. Okay, so if we um, did the mathematics for all this, and the mathematics are in the book, but for the moment we're not going to do that, we're just going to make the point that the moment stress is a maximum at the center, and the moment is a maximum. The moment varies parabolically with distance along the beam. The moment is zero at each end and a maximum in the middle. And this, of course, is one of the reasons why we tend to see beams fail at the center.
uh, relative to the issue of shear, let's go back for a second and look at our free body. And we're going to introduce, in addition to moment, we're going to introduce another quantity, which we're going to call the uh, shear on that face. And we represent that with the symbol V. So I'm going to come down here and I'm going to take a slice through the original object right here and create this free body which has the stress block W over a distance X. So I've used the symbol X to say this is some general dimension and I can solve it in terms of X and then I can go plug in any X value that I want to look at. But mainly I also want to be able to plot it just to see how it varies. So this distribution of force, W, which would be in kips per foot, is over a length X, which produces a resultant equivalent force, which is W times X. That would be in kips, and it would be centered halfway along the beam, because that's where the distribution is occurring. So we come to the center of that distribution, we place the force there, and this distance now becomes x over 2 and x over 2. We still have our reactive force at the end, which is WL over 2. Um, now, before we cut it at the center, and we realized there was no shear force because there was a W uh, L over 2 net equivalent downward force from that stress block and the same reactive value upwards. But now we have to draw in a force which represents the shear on that interface because this force is actually bigger than that one and this object would not be in equilibrium if there's not some kind of a shear force here. So that shear we designate with this arrow which is a uh, an odd uh, half an arrowhead to sort of suggest that it's tangent or parallel to the face that was cut there. We designate that with the symbol V. And now I want to talk about what V would be if we made this slice closer and closer to the end, this force would approach zero because X would approach zero. So this force would approach zero and as we get closer and closer to the end, V would have to approach this reaction, which is WL over 2. Um, so that tells us, in a way, that the instant we get onto the beam, just beyond this support force, the shear on that interface, or that face, if we created the free body there, would be WL over 2. So we can now come over here, and in this diagram we're showing the beam. We're plotting x in the direction to the right. Uh, and when we do that, we see that the shear starts off as WL over 2. In other words, there's really high shear there. As we slide this slice point more and more to the right, we accumulate more and more of this WX force because x gets larger. And when x gets to be L over 2, we have W L over 2 down, W L over 2 up, and the shear force is 0. In other words, here, the shear force is 0. Uh, as we move further and further across the beam, we get more and more of this W X. And when we get very close to the end, so our free body essentially goes from there all the way back to there, we have that much fr free body. Excuse me, I pushed the wrong button there. So when we have that much free body, uh, basically the shear force has to be in the opposite direction. It has to be pushing up. And we took this as our definition of the positive shear direction. And when we solve for that V, we get a negative number. So consistent with that convention, we start off with this big WL over 2 and it goes down and becomes negative WL over 2 and then when we pass just beyond the support force right there and step off the end of the beam we have no more shear. So our shear diagram shows very high positive shear on this end, very high negative shear on that end. If this is a homogeneous material like a, a piece of wood or, a, or steel or aluminum the difference between those two shears makes no difference. 
uh, one um, is sort of one part of the free body is shearing in one direction and in the other case it's shearing in the other direction but um, the key thing is we have major shear issues near the ends no shear at the center so those are the two things we have to really be uh, careful with uh, if I look at this stress block you'll notice that it also suggests something let me go back for a second this shear right here is a shear force on a vertical surface it's vertical shear when we go look at this stress block we also get the clue that there's horizontal shear here because we got this beam with this enormous stress block here that's pushing in that direction and then we got a stress block that's pulling in this direction and that's creating shear along that plane so the plane that we previously dubbed the neutral axis or the neutral plane is actually not neutral at all when it comes to shear the maximum shearing stress is occurring along that plane now this is this is a fairly subtle point that takes a little while to prove but I'm going to make the following statement which you can take as absolute truth at every single point in any stressed medium the vertical shear will be exactly equal to the horizontal shear so these two things go together and the horizontal shear is a maximum along this plane the vertical shear is largest near the end we just demonstrated it and it goes through zero in the middle and becomes negative and large at the other end so what this tells you is the worst shear forces are going to occur at the ends and at the neutral axis and this will become really apparent in the failure of certain wood beams where the grain tends to be weak along this plane and the horizontal shear becomes the failure mode because wood with grain running this way is very resistive to the vertical shear the two stresses are equal but the material is much stronger in resisting vertical shear than in resisting horizontal shear so we see this kind of failure mode at the ends in wood or tearing in the middle due to moment failure these are the two prime failure modes for wood and there's a third design issue which is often the one that governs and that is deflection um, we're not showing that as a failure mode but it has to be designed for because people are not going to tolerate floors with very uh, large amounts of deflection or floors that vibrate and move too much when people walk or bounce across that ends our first video on the subject of beams from chapter 6 focusing on shear and moment diagrams and shear stress and moment stress.